Yeah, okay, so with that passage in front of you, we're looking at material from this booklet, Listen Up, which applies very much some of the verses in Luke where Jesus says, therefore consider carefully how you listen. You'll see that in verse 18. So Luke 8, verse 18. So Jesus says, therefore consider carefully how you listen. And so, clever bloke like Christopher Ash put this booklet together, which has really helped me and quite a few others who are sat here tonight. And I thought it'd be good to go through about half of the material rather than all of it, because it's quite a lot, and to talk about it, talk about it with the, p- the people nearby you. So, probably twos, threes, you might start to figure out who that's going to be now. Um, yeah, just having a little look around. Um, so that'll be coming up. There'll definitely a chance to talk about things without me coming up to you and saying, so what did you say? I generally won't be asked, well, I won't be asking you that. What did you say? Um, I might be listening in, though. So anyway, Jesus is really clear in Luke chapter 8. It really matters how we listen to what God is saying through his word. Through preaching and teaching and reading the Bible and lots of other ways, Jesus makes it really clear. Look down at Luke 8 verse 18 again. Jesus says, therefore, consider carefully how you listen. And as a lot of Bible teachers say, when you see therefore, you need to ask, what is it there for? And, well, what is it there for? Well, one of the reasons is to get us to look back at the parable of the sower in verses, and the explanation in verses 11 to 15. So I'll read that sometimes called the parable of the sower, sometimes called the parable of the soils. You could call it the parable of the hearers. Because you have four groups here that listen to the word of God, but only one group actually passes the test. There are three groups that don't listen in the, in the right way, in the persevering way that God wants for, for us. Okay, so here we go. Luke 8, verse 11, Jesus says, This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. And for us, generally, that looks like this. The seed is the word of God. What God says, those along the path are the ones who hear. So you've got these people who hear. They hear the word of God. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So that's the first group. Then verse 13 Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy. They seem like joyous Christians, perhaps. And it says, when they hear it. So they also hear the word, but they have no roots. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Then the next group. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear. They also hear the word of God, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries riches and pleasures and they do not mature and finally more more hearers but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word they also hear the word they retain it and by persevering produce a crop now in all four cases everybody hears the word I don't think this had struck me very much before, but they all hear the word. But only one soil is the good soil. Only one group in the final analysis is listening rightly to what God is saying. And I would imagine in most churches over the years, you'll have all four going on, quite often all four at the same time, of of these soils. So how do we make sure that we are the good, good listeners, the good soil that Jesus speaks of in verse 15? Let me read verse 15 again. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. They have this noble and good heart. Well, something that God's gifted them by the Spirit. They have the right heart when it comes to listening to this. So what does that look like? Well, let me read a couple of examples in, it's on page four, I'm imagining most of you don't have this, oh, some people have actually brought it, right. Uh, By the way, 
If you wanted to take one of these at the end, they're, uh, I'll just leave them there. We have spares, but I'm, I'm only going to read this bit from it directly and nothing else directly. So what do you make of these two? So two different people in church and uh, it's kind of obvious when it gets down to it, which one seems to have the right heart about things? Let's start with Adam. So Adam, Adam couldn't really be doing with sermons. There were a number of things he liked about church, especially the friends he had made and the music, when the new music group were leading, whatever that means, but he didn't like the sermons. He felt he had to put up with the sermons because it would look a bit bad if he walked off when the preacher started. They just seemed a bit dull. And faced with the entertainment choice, here it says, between the crown and the sermon, it was a no-brainer. The crown won any day. Okay, so that's Adam. Then you've got Beth. Beth was really looking forward to the sermon. Last Sunday, she'd gone up to the preacher and said, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone has ever said this to me, but it went up to the preacher and said, I'm so looking forward to next Sunday. I can't wait. And the, the preacher looked a bit pleased if a bit surprised but but Beth wasn't being a creep like teacher's pet she really did look forward to the sermon with a sense of eager anticipation she wondered what God was going to say to her she felt as if someone had told her to expect a telephone call from the US president all week she was as it were waiting by the phone couldn't wait to hear what God was going to say so when the sermon started she was paying close and eager attention okay and we're told to consider carefully how you listen it, i mean they're kind of almost black and white examples there like very chalk and cheese whatever but beth certainly has the right heart you know she is expectant of what's to come when someone's going to preach when there's when there's a sermon it says she really did look forward to the sermon with a sense of eager expectation. Now, often that has not been me. You know, I, and some Sundays I just completely forget and I'm just sat there like it's some kind of lecture, you know. But there's how we need to remind ourselves. God is speaking and the eager expectation. What is God going to say to us today through his word? When, there's, when it's faithful preaching, God is speaking with open mouth. Right, let's have a look at the PowerPoint slides a little bit now. So we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 20, 23 will be the first one. So these will all be on the screen from now on. You can try and flick to the, the pages. It's probably going to be easier just to look at it on the screen, although that's a bit blue. Um, so we'll see how we do. So more examples of how powerful God's word is. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Look at the power here and the permanence of when God speaks. It says, well, Peter writes, For you have been born again. How did that happen? Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. God spoke into your life and this helped to bring about you being born again. And then verse 24, for all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Something else. But the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Do you see how powerful God's word is? It, it takes us from death to life. It is something that stands forever. We as people, we're here for a little while and then we're gone. Many of us gone to glory, wonderfully. But God's word stands forever and it was the word, it is the word that was preached to you. God is speaking with open mouth. He is speaking today through his word and in other ways, but chiefly through what he says here. So also, 1 Thessalonians 2, let me turn to this. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 talks about the, the power of God's word, God speaking right here, right now, transforming lives. So verse 13, 
This is probably why this Beth girl is excited when she hears preaching. She's like, God can speak to me through this, like directly to me, little me. So Paul writes to the Thessalonians, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, God speaking, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. This, this way that God works in our lives. By his word, God is speaking. And also, look at the, this next bit here. What Peter says, but the high place he gives to teaching preaching in in the local church 1 Peter 4 11 he says if anyone speaks he should do it as one speaking the very words of God through faithful preaching God is speaking of course that doesn't happen with every single preach it every single moment of preaching there when particularly if it's a you know, if, if we're talking uh, this heretical, uh, heretical preacher, I'm getting my teeth in. Is it, I'm thinking, is it a heretical or an heretical? My English is terrible. But anyway, when there's, when there's heresy, when someone's got this open and they're spouting heresy, God is not speaking. But when the Bible is preached faithfully, then we're in a, a position to experience what we had on a previous slide where it talks about this bit. Uh, there we go. The living and enduring word of God is what can come through to us through faithful preaching. Now, I've got a few practical steps here about how you could make the most of a sermon. Now, just have a look at these. I'm going to read them out and see if there's one of these that you might want to scribble down or just make a note on your phone because you think, yeah, I think that would help. I think that would help in this uh, this whole, with the preaching at, at Davenport Road, to, to help me, to help others. I think that might help. So, would any of these be useful for you to scribble down? Maybe you can pick one. Maybe you do them all already. Here we go. The first one is, pray for next Sunday's preacher in the middle of the week. It's the middle of the week, I'm preaching on Sunday. Thank you, that would be lovely. Okay, the second one is, pray for yourself. That God, You can do Sam's sneaky thing of just taking a picture of it, because that saves noting it all down. I have done that before in this very place. I, I applaud you. Right, okay. The second one is pray for yourself that God by his spirit would grow that expectation in yourself for whenever God's word is preached. That you're kind of like edge of the seat stuff. No matter who is preaching, it's like the Bible is open, someone's trying to preach faithfully, edge of the seat stuff. The third thing, if possible, try not to come to the sermon exhausted but well rested and attentive. Some of you are like, yeah, right, that's never going to happen at the moment with uh, my job or my family situation or my uh, insomnia. But if you can, if you can, come to the sermon not, e not exhausted but well rested and attentive. <laughs> Some people actually have the freedom to do that, believe it or not. Yeah, it's true. Okay, the fourth one, just before the sermon, this is, I like this, remind yourself, just a reminder, this is when God speaks to me. Okay, it's not the only time. But it is a critical time. This is when God speaks to me and pray, Lord, speak to me, I am listening. Now, some questions with the person next to you. Um, These are just a couple of little things about listening to preaching. Do you think it's better to take notes when the sermon is on or not? Why? There is actually no rule on that. Either way, there's, there's no rule. But just... Um, what do you think? And the second one, so it's going to be to chat for a couple of minutes. Is it better to hear the sermon in church or is it better, you're better off at home? And why would that be or why not? So have a quick chat about those two and then we'll come back to the next thing.
Okay, if you could try and rein that one in a little bit, and we'll, um, we'll move on. Just make a few comments about that, actually. Do you, do you think it's better to take notes when the sermon is on or not? Why? Um, I mean, pastors and stuff, they have different opinions on this. So some will say, oh, yeah, I prefer it when they're taking notes and they'll really push it from the front. And others will say, please don't take any notes. I want you to feel the force of this and not hide behind your notepad. So I'm like, okay, okay. I think both are fine. I think both are good. I get kind of encouraged when people are taking notes. I'm like, oh, they're taking notes, okay. Or just, uh, there was one place where I thought all these, I was, I was speaking somewhere else, and I thought all these kids were really um, taking notes, but they were just doing mannerism bingo. <laughs> so one of them, one of them got, every time I, every time I went, <laughs> There's a mark for them. Every time I went like this, there's a mark for them. And, or if I went like that, there's a mark for that. And then they kind of just touched the hair, there's a mark for... Oh, yeah. Those kind of notes, no. But the... Um, <laughs> don't get any ideas. But the... Uh, yeah, no, it, I find it helpful myself to take notes sometimes, but not always, to kind of mix it up a bit. Um, yeah, and then is it better to hear the sermon in church or better at home? Uh, the... There, we did find that there were some advantages when we were at home, I suppose, um, at times. The, more of the Christopher Ash answer would be, uh, overall, if you had a choice, definitely to hear the sermon in church. And he gives a few reasons. I'll just... I've got about six. They almost sound the same, but I've got six reasons. He says, when we listen together, we are accountable to one another for our response. We can spur one another on to love and good deeds. So we're accountable. If, if there's something about, oh, don't gossip, and then we're all gossiping afterwards, it's like, hey, just a minute. Didn't we just hear something about this? Uh, the second one, we're far less likely to get distracted. That's definitely true for me. Far less likely to break it in the middle and just kind of, or, or just go, oh, look at that. Look at that bird out on my window. Oh, yeah. um, third thing, you can't hit the pause button. You actually might like that. I mean, sometimes it's quite nice, but you can't kind of go, oh, stop there. Which means the next one, you can't press stop if it gets uncomfortable. Oh, I don't like this. You have to sit through the whole lot, unless you're, like, bold enough to just walk out. Um, the fifth one, immediately there's an opportunity to talk, not just with the people in your house, but with a wide variety of people in person straight after the, ser after the sermon. The sixth thing is many passages in the Bible are about us together, not me, the individual. So, like, what, what we become, we actually become together, as well as in our own times with the Lord. So, speaking about talking about sermons, how should we talk about the sermon after the meeting? Are there right ways and wrong ways to talk about the sermon because there are so you've probably come across the entire range in your life of how people talk about sermons so how should how should we talk about the sermon you know say like Nigel was preaching on Sunday what was the kind of and you you want to talk about the sermon what what are some of the right ways wrong ways to, to go about that go for it
Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, if we could try and break that one up a little bit. And so I'll talk a little bit about wrong ways, if there is such a thing as a wrong way to respond, and right ways. Trying to, I'm basically trying to get the ideas from this guy, but a few things from my own head as well. So. Uh, a bit of a confession, I fall into one of the wrong ways he said, well I have done like massively through my adult life, uh, which is basically being the judge, the critic, the kind of, in the days of strictly an X, X factor, I'm like, right, I am now going to mark this sermon out of 10. Well, not quite, but I kind of, uh, like afterwards, I'll sort of say, yeah, that was, that was good preaching. Uh, I wouldn't have said it like da 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 or, yeah. And I was trying to think, why do I fall into that too often? Probably because it's a bit of a human thing to do things like that. But also, I, yeah, I used to be a teacher. So it was like, you're kind of supposed to spot the mistake, the error, the area for improvement, right? It was just, I was just programmed to do that. So I, I do find it quite hard to avoid this kind of wrong way of just being the kind of sermon reviewer, like the amateur reviewer of, of sermons, um, which most of the time is just plain wrong. Uh, sometimes it's right. You might be in a sermon class and they're all sitting there with the review of like, um, yeah, just what you can improve on. So yeah, the, the critic, the, the wrong way of doing this. So it might be picking at a weakness of some part of the sermon. So this is immediately afterwards. Um, it, I hope it will become clear later why these things are not a good idea. Um, it should become clear. It might not be clear yet. So picking at some weakness of the sermon, you think like, yeah, you would say this, you're a preacher, right? Okay. Um, picking at the style, I don't really like the way they say it. Um, it's not very um, user-friendly or whatever. Or it might have touched on your favorite hobby horse. So what we might get is, um, yeah, there wasn't enough of the wrath of God in that one. Or, um, oh, there was too much of the wrath of God in that one. Because <laughs> like, uh, this might be a bit of a hobby horse. Um, or there's lack of structure. I just didn't know where it was going, you know. And sometimes I'll admit, I'll sit there thinking, I don't know where it's going, like sermons over the history of my life, I'm like, where is this going? I realise people often say that about mine. <laughs> where is this going, Steve? Um, or it's just, you, you just sit there and think, man, it's too dull. So when someone asks you, it's like, it's just a lot of words. You know? Or you just thought it was too long. Now, we may feel a lot of these things, but to actually do that as, you know, this is, this is what we talk about after the sermon has just happened, either back there or in here, most of the time is plain wrong. But then there's a more subtle one, which is like this, that just shows I am only listening at a very basic level. So you kind of say, so um, what do you think of the sermon today? Oh yeah, I really like the story. Yeah, it was quite interesting. Do you remember anything about it? No. Uh, it was just really interesting, wasn't it? Something about Antarctica, really interesting. Or like, oh, I really like the joke. It was funny, wasn't it? It's was funny, you know. Right, let's, let's talk about right ways of responding. And here we go. Better ways to respond, should we say. It's where we go deeper and we actually talk in ways that are good for us. Which is why it's better, because it's, it's good for us. So here we go. The, the first one is, um, and it's all to do with our response. Our personal response to what we've heard so that we might be changed, transformed. So, you might say, yeah, what do you think of the sermon? Yeah, I was really challenged by um, that thing about generosity that he said on Sunday. Uh, think about, you know, giving lifts to people, because I've got a car and I don't give lifts to anybody. So, it could be like that. Or, um, I was really encouraged by, um, yeah, I was just really encouraged by the emphasis on generosity and how I've got such a generous God. I just found that so... Um, what, a, what a wonderful God we have. Or it could be this one. It was so helpful to be reminded of... Um, yeah, it was so helpful to be reminded of the practical ways that generosity works itself out 
in our lives. And it's really got me thinking about uh, one or two things that uh, I might do. Or finally, uh, can you help me understand the bit where the preacher says, <laughs> okay, this might be, um, you know, sometimes we just don't under understand a particular bit. So, yeah, it was, I really enjoyed the preaching. I, there's just a bit I didn't quite understand. Could you help me understand that bit about the exile? I've never heard what, uh, what is the exile? I don't know. Nobody's told me about the exile before. Or, um, yeah, they were talking about atonement. Like what? I think there's a film called Atonement, but I don't know what it, I don't know what it's about. Like, um, so the cool thing about responses like this is they can cause us to grow. Compared with all the other stuff of like, let's be judge and jury, and I've, I've slipped into that so many times. If you do it on a regular occasion, on regular occasions, I've done it on regular occasions as well. But what I'd like to be more like is this person who responds to the preaching and is looking for how am I going to respond to this personally? Okay. A completely different question, slightly related, but not. For you to have a chat about. Uh, how necessary, is it necessary to be in, chur in church week after week? Why, why not? It's not possible for everybody, but do you think it's necessary uh, I don't, not to turn us into legalists or Pharisees here, but how, how necessary would you say it is? How necessary is it for you to be in church week after week and maybe explain why that is? Particularly thinking about the preaching of God's word. Okay, let's take a minute or two on that. Go for it. Okay, let's, let's move on from that. Yeah. Okay, so obviously not everyone can be in church there every week. Um, my, I mean, I've grown up in a house where dad was working for the police. Uh, Mum was a nurse, they're on shifts, it's pretty inconsistent as to when we were in church. Um, but as for each one of us, we, we want to do all we can to be there week after week if we can. And the reason for starters is the more we are 
in church and we're listening intently, expectantly, prayerfully open to what God could be saying to us today, the more opportunity we have to hear from God, to grow in God, to become more like Jesus. It's, it's good stuff. Now, here's, here's a question not to say out loud. Don't, don't discuss this, but have you, um, have you ever applied the preaching to somebody else and not yourself? Of course you have. This happens all the time. It's like the go-to, isn't it? Do you know, if only such and such was here, were here, they, they'd really benefit from hearing about this. You know, wouldn't they? Um, had someone the other week saying, I think this is a good one for you to hear, Steve. I'm like, I preached it. What? what? <laughs> anyway, so then I can apply it to me. I know, like I do apply it to myself. Okay. <laughs> so just a, a quick question to um, just think about. What is the, just to think in your head, what is the danger of regularly applying the preaching to other people or even the wicked world around us, as some folks think, oh, it's so wicked out there. If only they could be in here to hear this, this wonderful preaching, you know. Um, what, is the, what is the danger of regularly applying the preaching to other people? Just think, think, all right. Big danger is I'm not applying it to me, and you're not applying it to you. You know, it's just, but it's such a classic. It's happening all the time. Like, number of conversations in my own head of like, oh, if only this person was here. And uh, conversations I've had with other people who've said to me directly, if I only such and such, and you're like, oh, man. If you want to be the best kind of listener to preaching, the kind that leads to love for the Lord and practical obedience, this, well, that is it. That's the best kind of listening. Jesus talked about some, some of this, and James talked about this about the best kind of listening. So Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, you will obey what I command. It's it's basically this, we listen and it leads to practical obedience to Jesus. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And we read James and he says, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. So we listen, and it leads to practical obedience. A number of times I've walked out of um, listening to a sermon, and the conversation goes a bit like, oh, that was, that was really good. Wasn't that really good? Oh, that was really good. And then we go away, and it doesn't make any difference whatsoever, because it's in one ear, out the other. You know, we've just, what we've done is just gone, yeah, that was, yeah, that was really good, yeah. What exactly? That was just really good. Let's get specific. There's very specific things here about do what it says. You will obey what Jesus commands. Some more of this in Luke 6. Jesus says it this way. So Luke 6, verse 47, Jesus says, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. Do you see, again, it's like listening and then practical obedience. And then we're told what it's like. If we do that, verse 48, you'll know this one. You'll know an action song, probably. We'll just do the first bit, though. Uh, He's like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation. I mean, this was just made for an action song, wasn't it? Dug down deep. Um, Laid the foundation on rock. On rock. A flood came. (laughs) The torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. Built on rock, well built. And what's the good building going on? It's the end of verse 47. We hear the words of Jesus and we put them into practice. Like we listen and it leads to practical obedience to Jesus. And there's more of the same in Luke 8, 21. Jesus replies about his real family, his eternal family, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Listen, we listen, but not in the way that just goes, oh, that was such a lovely sermon, such a lovely sermon. It's like, no, we listen and we put it into practice. So let's be praying for our own practical obedience. As we hear the word being preached, I don't know, 
Here's another little point about this. Do you see, we're not simply listening for information. Like some conversations I have with Christians, it sounds like we're a bunch of librarians just amassing information. Uh, and then the question is, what did you learn from the sermon? What did I learn? What is this school? What did, what did you learn from the sermon? As if it's like information, just stack information. You know, you just learn, I learned something else, I learned something else. This is, this is great. Look at the pile of stuff that I learned. Um, but we are actually listening for transformation. It is information. We do need the information, but that's meant to go somewhere. We listen, and it leads to transformation. So instead of asking folks after the sermon, what did you learn? What is this, school? We do need to learn things, but if that's as far as we get, it is just school. What did you learn? Well, actually, more like this. What's your response? Uh, Maybe I've got this. Yeah, here we go. This is linked to some things I think we've said before about your positive response. So instead of asking people, what did you learn? Say this is a Derby Bible Week conversation, or it could be a Sunday conversation. Instead of saying, what did you learn? What challenged you? What encouraged you? Was there, this might be one to take a photo of, Sam, if you're into photos, yeah. Um, It's going to be gone soon. What encouraged you? Was there something to thank God for? Did God remind you of how you need to trust him specifically? Maybe something coming up this next week that you were listening and it just reminded you, I need to trust God with that this week because of what I've heard today or what God's reminded me of today. So let's move on. Some practical suggestions of how to listen actively to sermons. I haven't got an awful lot more to say, by the way, and just in case you're worried how long this is going to be. But, yeah, how to listen actively to sermons and please stay with me on this one. Um, listening, to, listening actively to sermons. How about this? Apply it to other people. Please stay with me. Let me quote Christopher Ash on this. He says, After this week's sermon, write down all the ways you wish that other people would obey that teaching. Don't hold back. When you've written it all down, tear it up. Tear it up. And please stop applying sermons to other people. Just stop it. I have to say this to myself as well. Just stop applying them to other people. Apply sermons to yourself. Like if you get nothing else from tonight, let's just remind ourselves, apply the sermon to you. Now there's an easy way to apply the sermon to you. As you listen, I mean this is for those who don't like taking notes, this is for anybody. Because there's only one note to take in this particular sermon. As you listen to the sermon from the Bible, write down definitely and as precisely as you can one thing you need to do. You could try this on Sunday. I'm speaking about the resurrection and you could write down one thing. You listen to the whole thing and you write down one thing that you're going to do in response to that. Now, if if we did that, For every single sermon we listen to, transformation. Like, cut through the information to the transformation. We need the information. But transformation, even better. Write down one thing you need to do. So, Christopher Ash gives some options here. Uh, It may be some action you need to take to obey this Bible passage or a change of attitude, or an alteration in the way you speak, or some action you need to stop doing, or start doing. Or it could be from our previous list, about just write down one thing that challenged you, that you might do something about. Write down one thing that encouraged you. You might just, your action might be just to praise God for that encouragement, or to thank God for something in that passage of scripture. Or there might, there might be one thing you need to trust God with this week that has been flagged up by this. A way to remember this is... Uh, this, right. Where is the concrete? Where is the concrete? Where is the, what on earth am I talking about? Where is the concrete? If it helps to remind you, um, perhaps even bring a lump of concrete in with you on Sunday 
as you remind yourself, I need to remember where is the concrete. And what I'm talking about, well, hopefully I'll get there. In other words, where is the one concrete action that you are going to note down that you are going to do in response? Sometimes you might not find anything. You're just like, well, it was a good sermon. You know, I just, there wasn't anything I could find to thank God for or to repent of or to ask him about in response to this in prayer. Um, but even in the most turgid preaching, I think that's a phrase from my dad actually, turgid preaching. <laughs> um, maybe turgid actually means something, I don't know. But uh, well, in some of the worst preaching you've ever heard, if the Bible is open, you'll nearly always find one thing that you could do. Something to praise God for, something to trust God with. Now, after a few weeks, you might have a number of concrete things. You're like, where's the concrete? It's in my little notepad. I've got like six things now. Concrete, concrete. So I've got six things to do. Um, so then what do you do? Well, suggestion from your man, Christopher Ash, is to review your list of concrete responses, perhaps once a week or once a fortnight, once a month, and ask yourself, it's, as you're praying, just go look at your list and go, Lord, help me. And on that list, there might be things to immediately pray for. I mean, the big thing with all of this is we, we want to pray for God's help. Like, Lord, help me to listen to what you're saying. Make me the good soil more and more and more. Let's pray now for his help. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. How we have been helped over the years. Wow. The, where we were and where you've brought us to. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that by your spirit, active in our lives, by your word, active living and active, you have been transforming us. We are not yet what we should be, but we're certainly not what we were. And thank you, Lord, for doing that. We ask tonight that you'd reinvigorate us. Help us to be those um, ex excited almost, excited people, full of anticipation whenever your word is open in a Bible study, or when there's preaching, or when we're talking about your word in a one-to-one, -one or whatever. Lord, help us to know more of that excitement of you speaking to us. Help, help us with our attitudes to, to be spot on as, as you look upon us. Not as what anybody else thinks, but help us to have that really humble attitude, trembling at your word but also looking forward to the good things there and to your voice, your very voice in, in our lives. Father, thank you that you speak today. Thank you that you transform lives and help us to, to listen in those wonderful ways that we saw in the parable of the sower of um, that good soil that's so fruitful. Help us, we pray. Oh, Amen. So we will finish.